<laughs> so speaking of food sources, what, what has kind of happened to our food source? I mean, you know, um, yeah. you, you hear these people kind of make these analogies and they'll say, uh, the pussification of our society and, and how men aren't as manly anymore. And, you know, um, we're not like digging ditches and carrying buckets of water and going out and, you know, jumping on a wild boar's back and breaking its neck and things, like, yeah. things like that. Right. Um, well, you are, but yeah, most yeah. people aren't. Well, I, I do it just for the practice, just for fun, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, we're not as like, um, we're not kind of forced to do these things, maybe not forced to use tools. And, and so therefore, um, yeah, maybe we're not, maybe the women aren't as womenly as they normally would be under normal circumstances. You can take that at whatever way you want. <laughs> and maybe the men aren't as quote unquote manly, uh, as they used to be. And, and maybe some of the stuff has to do with our, our food and our water. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a really hot button topic right now because of all the gender identity, yeah, identity right. stuff and politics. But from a chemistry perspective, I mean, there's no dying. Obviously there's differences between men and women in terms right. of hormones and chemicals in your body. And yeah, I mean, in science, they oftentimes call it male feminization. And I, I mean, a lot of scientists try and skirt around that. You know, they, they say, <laughs> quote unquote. <laughs> yeah, they try and avoid that term. But if they're being honest, I think, you know, a lot of times you see that and, you, and that's for men. Right. right. And, and just an example of that would be lower testosterone, right? Which we see, you know, since 1990, the average man was about 500. Then in the 2000s, it was about 400. And mm. now it's about 300 is the average testosterone in men. Shit. And they, the, yeah, the companies, the lab companies have even dropped their base, their, you know, what they consider normal, their normal range has dropped. So in other words, if you come in with 250, you know, in 1990, they'd say, oh, you shit, you're low. Right. Mm. And today they say, well, you're good. You're normal right. because that's normal. And that's an example of male feminization. But you also see problems in women too, because puberty is getting a lot younger and younger. You know, for example, doctors are seeing a lot of eight-year-olds with puberty, you know, girls. And you see it in boys, too, actually, but m more so in, in women. And they're doing the exact same thing there. And I wrote about this in my book because they're trying to redefine the normal age range of puberty now because it's become so common. Wow. And that's, I think that's because of these artificial chemicals that we're exposed to in our food, in our water, you know, in our personal care product, right. which is a huge source that most people are. So just, uh, the, the general basis of it is that, uh, maybe the automobiles that we have and maybe some of the ways that we care for our crops and maybe just, uh, I don't know, the toxification of the earth, uh, from us living here, maybe all these, uh, things have uh, contaminated our foods with things that could potentially, uh, raise our estrogen levels yeah. and, um, your and your estrogen and your testosterone levels i would imagine uh there's some give and take on that like yep. your estrogen yep. is being elevated by something maybe your testosterone might drop and maybe yep. vice versa yep. yep and it's especially through the the protein called shbg which i know you know a lot about but basically in my book i call that the limo service for hormones mm. to try and make it simple for people to understand because testosterone and estrogen they both float on water right you know it's like cholesterol they're made from cholesterol both of them and that's one of the definitions of a sex hormone. It's a hormone made from cholesterol mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know. So it's like, uh, would it be, is it fat soluble? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the issues with the artificial estrogens. They store in your fat. Um, but basically just to get around your bloodstream, you know, your blood is aqueous. It's like water. So they can't just get around your blood. So they need to get in the limo, right? They need to get on SHBG and both estrogen and testosterone both ride that same limo. They both ride SHBG to mm -hmm. get around your blood. So they're competitive with each other. And that's one of the ways your body kind of detects and regulates that relationship. And it's a delicate balance. Right. And the other aspect of estrogen, natural estrogen and testosterone, frankly, is they're at the nanogram levels in our body. Nanogram. And that's 10 to the minus ninth grams. Yeah, small, I mean, that's, right? yeah, that's a difficult thing to measure. And so, you know, when I'm talking about men's estrogen, mm -hmm. usually I'm talking about 20 nanograms per liter. That's the natural level. Right. Usually women, interestingly enough, they're also about 20 up to 400. They range depending mm -hmm. on the time of the month. So most people would think, you know, women are in the thousands, right? They think women right. are so much more estrogen and that 
That's true if a woman is pregnant, they start getting over a thousand. But for the most part, they're pretty similar to men. Again, it goes up to 400, but... Is the main difference uh, between a male and a female from a hormone perspective, is, is the main difference just uh, that men have more testosterone rather yeah, than yeah. there being like a, a, a greater absence or more estrogen? It's both, yeah. little yeah. combination of both, okay. Oh, yeah. Yep, and I mean, when you talk about male feminization, like say, there's other things. You obviously look at gonads, right? Another... I, I don't look at gonads. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in I, the I, lab, yeah, I caught a peak. I mean, here and there, a guy was squatting; he was in front of me. I, you know, I mean, when you go to the bathroom, you kind of peek over at the, yeah. you know, just just to kind of measure up yourself, see if you're doing, you know, you're adequate. Yeah, oh. seeing if you're doing okay. Yeah, <laughs> the old gonad check. Okay, maybe it's not so obvious, <laughs> but in the research lab, it's obvious that you would look at gonads to determine s- sexual differences and right. sexual changes, and they call it. Sec- uh, um, you know, sexual di- uh, uh, dysfunction, obviously. Mm. So, like for example, they found fish with sec- with issues in their gonads, right. and fish have internal gonads, so it's more complicated. But and then they start looking in the water, and in- inevitably, in all these different lakes where they find these deformations of fish gonads, mm-hmm. they find artificial estrogen chemicals, including birth control, and. You know, I mean, the levels that we're talking about for those chemicals are in the thousands of nanograms per liter. You know? So they're way above our natural yeah. estrogen level. So when we're drinking that, you know, I mean, you can argue about how much is absorbed through our gut lining. But So like these guys that are driving around with these nuts hanging off the back of their truck, <laughs> they kind of have a point, right? <laughs> are are, are yeah. the are, are sacks uh, shrinking because of yep. some of these things that oh, are yeah. going on? Yeah. In fact, there's something called anogenital distance, mm. um, and that's shrinking. Like, that's becoming more and more feminine in males today. There's a lot of things. I mean, most of it's just... Oh, I'm going to have to check around down there <laughs> <here> now. <laughs> see what the hell's going on. i got to get a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see... Well, yeah, you see it basically in the, in the future generations. You won't see right. that shrink in your own body, hopefully, right. Right. because that's more of a development. That was a close call. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. But... Like I say, it's a, it's, a, it's a controversial topic because a lot of people don't even want to acknowledge differences between men and women to begin with. Right. But obviously there's differences and scientists that are being real honest, they're, they're noting these differences and they're also doing experiments with atrazine, for example. Right? Like if you looked up atrazine and male feminization, you'll find papers on different animals. Mm. You don't want to do this in humans, obviously. You don't want to dose somebody with a bunch of this herbicide. Right. It's a herbicide. Got it. And they spray it on grains. <clears throat> And, you know, it causes male feminization at a, a frogs at about 200 nanograms per liter. Um, and what's uh, with atrazine, right? So if you put 200 nanograms per liter in the water, you get a male frog start turning into a female frog. Wow. And what's crazy about that is the, F, the uh, EPA allows 3,000 nanograms per liter of atrazine in our drinking water mm. supply. So how much of an impact is that having on us? I mean, <laughs> right. you know? And I think the biggest the biggest way that we see it, practically speaking, we see this feminization in males today is through motivation because that's where the studies are real clear. If you give, you know, again, during the developmental stage, yeah, you're going to change these things like anogenital distance and these weird things, right? <clears throat> but um, you see... It can you, affect more general things as well. It, well, in, in, in adults, it affects motivation. So if you give an adult rat a bunch of these artificial estrogens like BPA, or phthalates or whatever mm-hmm. estrogen, whatever estrogen chemical, it, it drops off their motivation, sex motivation, but also just general motivation, you know, to do anything. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you really see in our culture today. You see a lot of men that just oh, aren't motivated I, to do anything. Uh, we get, I mean, that's why people tune in. They're like, uh, you know, I need to get hyped up. And, you know, I do a lot of these podcasts I, I do on my own as well. And I try to walk people through you know, this kind of recipe of how to kind of stay motivated, how to stay out in front of things. Uh, I try to teach people like, you know, you do have a lot more control over things. And, and I don't know a lot of the science behind, I don't know, you know, dopamine and all these different things that go on in your head. But I do know that uh, the more that you can try to get ahead, if you can figure out a way of even just, and you don't have to be ahead of everybody else, you just need to be ahead of yourself. So um, if you can figure out a way of kind of going through a checklist every day and hammering it out the best that you possibly can, let's say you get five good tasks done every single day, um, the better that you start to master that, 
the more momentum you're able to get. And I'm sure even that process sends a cascade of different hormones that are probably going in your favor. Um, even something as simple as I, I really heavily recommend that people start to prepare their foods and people start to, now there's intermittent fasting and there's different things, but you should still know, like children don't leave the house without mom or dad saying, hey, you got your lunch? Um, or the kid eats at school or whatever the case may be. But adults leave the house with no, they don't have anything set up. And the reason why I think it's important is because there's a lot of, it sounds silly to say it, but there's a, there's a lot of stress and anxiety about, hey, where do you want to go eat for lunch today? And you're like, well, I don't know. And maybe I'm trying to eat a certain way and you're trying, now, now we really don't know where to go. We only have an hour. Our boss is going to be pissed if we're gone any longer than that. Parking's a pain. You know, it just causes a, a, this cascade of problems. And we've talked about these little things. Like you may lay out your clothes the night before. Just these little tiny things. Now, I'm not going to say that that's necessarily going to, like, build testosterone and you're going to be this, uh, you know, burly person or whatever your goal is. Um, but it, it will build willpower and it will help you get ahead and it helps help you stay ahead. And when you get in that position... You don't really need external motivation. It's uh, it, a lot of it's coming from within because you want to do more because you want to try to become more. Yeah. And um, I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I, I'm seeing it left and right. I got people that come up to me at trade shows and stuff and they're crying. Hmm. Um, and I'm saying, Hey man, I didn't force you to listen to my shit. I know it's boring. You don't have to cry out loud about it. <laughs> now they start they're... drinking tap water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Estrogen all yeah. over the place. But they're, um, they're very emotional about about uh, the fact that they can't seem to find their way or that we help them find their way or any of those combinations of things. Yeah. And well, I think that's one of the aspects of marijuana here in California that a lot of people are overlooking is that the marijuana smoke can act like estrogen. Mm. So eating it, fine. They've done a bunch of studies. Right. But for some reason, when you smoke it, it has an interaction with it acts like estrogen. Wow. And I include that in my book, which is, of course, not particularly popular but it's just a fact i want people to know especially in teenagers and i think that's one of the dangers and the risks of joe rogan somewhere he's getting pissed <laughs> <laughs> he's calling bullshit no and i've done a youtube video on this recently because um because that's a big problem if you're if you're trying to motivate yourself right and you're struggling but you're continuing to do something that like ingesting a chemical that's acting like estrogen that's inhibiting your motivation mm then it's a completely uphill battle, right? And, you know, again, I think that's one of the reasons they find that's a big factor with teenagers using marijuana. And again, no issue with marijuana. In fact, CBD is really, you know, unbelievably healthy, anti-inflammatory. Yeah. And I think there's even a positive interaction between THC, which is the chemical that makes you high, right. and CBD, mm. which is the anti-inflammatory compound in marijuana. <clears throat> which is kind of overlooked. Those right. two in concert act in a positive way. Mm. And I think, you know, I've been doing a lot of digging into that topic. But every time you dig deep into it, you, you see a lot of teenage motivation slash infertility that are related to, you know, apathy, that kind of thing, that are related to them smoking marijuana. There's I there's so hard. much to this story, you know. It's it's really <laughs> yep. it's really wild. You have something to add to that, Andrew? Yeah, no, I was just going to ask, like, how how fast would that like affect somebody? Like, I mean, it's a good question. Probably you know, cause, differential. Because right? old Billy back in the day, he had one marijuana cigarette and they turned into a chick. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, you know what I mean? Like, well, is it like a continued use? Like, I think yeah. If you dig a little bit deeper in it, I think it's a really cool topic because. There's a lot of weed heads that it, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't do anything to me. You know? Yeah, there's a couple things, right? So one of the one of the services that I provide people is 23andMe DNA analysis. Mm. And I recently, for example, did Ben Pakalski's DNA on air, you know. Nice. And, and one of the things that I look at when I'm doing DNA analysis is your genes involved in marijuana processing. One of those is estrogen. How does your body deal with estrogen? One of those is uh, paranoia. How paranoid right. might you get just based on your genetics? Hmm. We all differ in that regard. The gene is called AKT1. It's pretty well established. That the scientists usually call it psychosis because that sounds a yeah. lot more negative because there's a lot of negative context with marijuana in the scientific community, which I think is BS, but <laughs> it's just a historical fact. But um, paranoia is one. 
estrogen, like I said, is one. And then another one is schizophrenia, right? You want to look at the genes involved in schizophrenia. It's crazy. You can find out all these things through your genes. Yeah. Through yeah. just uh, Well, some of it's genetic testing. and then some of it's environmental. So everybody's going to have somewhat of an estrogen response, in my mind, from the marijuana smoke. But if you've got great genetics to handle mar- uh, to handle estrogen, to break down those chemicals, then you break it down quick and it doesn't mm. impact you that much. But if, if, it's, if those compounds are staying in your body a lot longer, you're going to have a longer impact. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then...